Come. 
crazy world.
He rose again so that our hope might be just secure. We will have eternal life with you. Defeated, defeated Satan, sin, and death. We praise you. We thank you for that. Hey, Father, I just pray. As we enter into the Lord's Supper, or we would see you, that we would remember what you have done for us. Or we are so thankful, we are so grateful for all that you have done. For without Jesus, we would have none. My Father, I just lift up this time of remembrance to you. That our hearts be melted before you. We praise you. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name and all his people say. You know, you think about 2024 and you think about that this is the first Sunday of the new year. The opportunity to come together and to start anew. And that brings to mind what Jesus did for us some 2,000 years ago. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, that when we think about the Lord's Supper, when we think about the opportunity to take communion together, he says, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. See, Jesus gave the opportunity when he had the Last Supper with his disciples he gave us the opportunity to remember the extreme obedience that we can have, the example that he set when he went to the cross. Now we, we understand that the, the Jewish people, that, that they celebrated Passover each and every year. And they did it with a meal. And when they did so, they were remembering God's redemption. And the night before Jesus was crucified, he gathered his disciples. He gathered those that were closest to him, those that he loved. He gathered them to himself for the Passover meal. But this time, it was going to be different. There was something different about this meal. So this time... I'm going to ask our deacons, those that are going to be helping with this this morning, to please come forward to take your places. And they are going to dismiss you a row at a time to come forward and to take the elements back to your seats.
This is just as it says in First Corinthians chapter eleven. Before we partake of the elements together, take a moment. Take a moment to reflect to yourself about what Christ has done, the sacrifice that He made. chapter 22 verse 19 it says this and he took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me
We are so thankful. We are so grateful for what you have done. You gave everything for us. He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. Heavenly Father, I just pray that each and every day we would remember what you have done. We live a lifestyle of worship to you. Every moment and every hour we are thankful. We will be thankful into eternity for every moment. Every hour. Father, I lift up Pastor Chris. I pray that you would give him clarity to speak. That your words would be heard clearly. And that word would land on fertile soil. Ready to receive it. But ultimately, we might be changed. We might have a desire to follow you more. To trust in you. praise you. We thank you for all that you do. Pray these things in Jesus' name and all his people say. Amen. Church, it truly is a blessing to be able to gather together and praise and worship on every, every week. Is it not? Amen. Amen. Well, family, we took a bit of a break to look at the Christmas season together. But I knew that God was going to bring us back to the commandments. I knew that he was going to bring us back to finishing up this portion of the Back to Basics series that he laid on my heart before Christmas came upon us. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to dive back in to the commandments, and we're going to start today by looking at the Eighth Commandment. But because we have taken a bit of a breather from the commandments, or break, if you will, we're going to do a little bit of a refresher, if you will. So if you will, before we do that, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and just put your finger there. But let's take a look at these together. They're right up here for you. All right, so the first one is one God, no idols, revere his name. Let's say these together, okay? Remembering to rest, honor your parents, no murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lying, no coveting. All right, very good. Now, before the next slide comes up, remember that when we go into these commandments, when we look at these commandments, a lot of times what happens is, is we, we tend to look at them and we tend to read them and we go, okay, well, I don't, I don't break that one. I mean, it's, we look at them for superficial value, right? We read them and we go, well, I don't murder anybody. I haven't killed anybody lately, right? But remember, as we've talked about these things, as we've looked at these commandments, it's very quickly understood that there is much more to the commandment than just simply reading it for face value. All right. So when you look at these, like for example, when you look at today's, when you look at stealing, it's deeper than just saying, well, I don't steal anything. Like for example, you, you, it goes even deeper than that. It goes into cheating, doesn't it? Right? Because you're not supposed to cheat when you're playing cards with friends. Are you? Right, Warner? There. Okay? I just gave myself up. Okay? When you're playing cards at 11, 11, 30 at night and you're completely zoning and you don't realize that you just looked at your friend's hand. Okay? There you go. All right, brother? There. there I just gave myself up. Okay? There you go. All right. <laughs> I just want to have a little fun with that because he he walked in this morning and he goes, remember our conversation? Yes, I remember our conversation. Okay. All right. But when you stop and think about it, so at least if you go to the next slide for me, okay? 
See, Norman Rockwell had a lot of paintings that he did, a lot of pictures that he did that often went into the Saturday Evening Post. And as you can see on this picture, you've got a butcher and you've got a, a, a woman. And this was probably around Thanksgiving. You've got a, a, a turkey there or a bird of some sort, okay? And she's buying this turkey. And this turkey is obviously being weighed. Okay, and you've got the butcher, he's behind, he's on one side, and then you've got the, the woman on the other side. She's waiting to get the bird. They both look pleased to some, to some extent. You could say that their intent, if you look at the picture, their intent is on the scale. They're looking up. But the picture actually shows something completely different, doesn't it? It actually shows what they're really doing. See, if you notice the butcher, what's he doing? He's pushing down on the scale. Why? He wants the price of the bird to go up. But what's she doing? She's pushing the scale up. Why? Because she wants the price of the bird to go down. She wants it to be cheaper. See, what Norman Rockwell is doing here is he's, he's portraying probably a, a charming scene of American life. It might make us chuckle a little bit. And it might sound somewhat far-fetched and it might actually make us roll our eyes if you actually look at this picture and go, are they breaking the Eighth Commandment? I bet no one's ever, if you've ever seen this picture before, or this is the first time you've looked at it, you probably wouldn't even think that. But see, Cecil Myers in his book, The Ten Commandments, actually points this picture out. He brings this picture into context and he says this, both the woman and the butcher would resent being called thieves. Why, you might ask? Well, because this lovely lady would never rob a bank or steal a car. And the butcher would be offended if anyone accused him of stealing. However, if a customer wrote a bad check, he may call the police. But see, neither of them saw any harm in a little bit of deception to take a few pennies out of her pocket for his gain or to keep a few pennies in her own pocket and take them from the butcher. Really, the deception could be described as stealing. I mean, think for a moment. What crime happens most often in our community that we probably don't even notice? Stealing. About our, what about our nation? Probably stealing. It happens so often that it's become commonplace in society. So do me a favor. Let's stand this morning in the honor of the reading of God's word as we look at one simple verse together. Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. It reads this. You shall not steal. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your love and your protection. Father, for your watch care over us. <laughs> Father God, I thank you for the, the privilege, the honor that we have had thus far to be gathered here together. Lord, to worship you and you alone because you are the one true and living God. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we dive into the Eighth Commandment, 
this morning that, Father, we would indeed block out all distractions. And, Father, that we would focus completely and intently on you and your word and what you have for us this morning. Lord, we know that your word does not return void. Lord, examine our hearts. May we learn and be taught today that we may leave here different than we came in. Father, we love you. We thank you for the worship that has led us to the throne. Father, may you be glorified, for it's in your name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. Listen, everybody knows that stealing is wrong. Right? Even people that don't read scripture, that don't know the words, you shall not steal. They understand that stealing is wrong, that it's not right. And I'm going to make a very literal statement here. And it is this, to steal is to take something that doesn't belong to you. Duh. Like I said, it's a very literal statement, right? William Barclay, theologian, says, says that stealing is what you would call a natural sin. Well, why is it a natural sin? Because here's the thing. It's human nature to want what we do not have. And thus, when that happens, it places in us a desire that could very well turn into action. And see, the illegitimate way to fulfill desire is to steal. To take something that doesn't belong to us. And thus, that is what we would call a heart problem. It's a heart problem. That's where it begins. It begins with a desire. It begins with an urge. Coveting, if you will. And then when it's carried out, that's when it becomes sin. James 1, 14 and 15 says this, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You know, Arthur Pink, another theologian, says that stealing, the first understanding of stealing was the first time was committed when Eve took the forbidden fruit in the garden. I hadn't thought about it that way before. That one of the first recorded sins, if not the first recorded sin of stealing, was committed by Israel when they entered into Canaan and Achan stole the spoils of war. And then you had how stealing defiled the early church when Ananias and Sapphira didn't give everything that they had gotten to the church to get given it to God from the sale of their property. You know, it's interesting to think about how this command is broken, how this command is violated. In a survey, this was very interesting, Barta Group, 86% of Americans, and this includes Christians, state that they keep this commandment, that they've never broken it. Here's the thing, someone's not telling the truth. <laughs> We're going to look at that command next week okay because <laughs> the thing is this is probably the most common crime in our country the top five crimes committed in the United States theft burglary motor vehicle theft aggravated assault and robbery notice that four of the five have to do with stealing See, in the Hebrew, there are two words that deal with this topic. 
and they're defined by one letter. Ganoth means to steal. Ganab with a B means a thief. See, Ganoth, stealing, is not only a sin against the individual or society, but it's also a sin against God. And it covers all of these things that we've already mentioned, you know, burglary, robbery, hijacking, shoplifting. It, it covers all of these things, but it also covers things that we don't often think about. How many of you often think about and sit around thinking about embezzlement or extortion? I don't. But it covers that. These are just partial ways that the Eighth Commandment is violated or broken. See, one commentator called the United States a country of thieves because we often just, we don't even think about it, we just take things without permission. I mean, I'm sure some of you watch the news this holiday season. Did you see on any of the news outlets in New York how... Department stores were being looted left and right. I mean, people were literally just running into the department stores as soon as they opened, and they were taking stuff off the racks. I mean, they didn't even care. They weren't taking hangers off, taking off any of the security devices, nothing. They were grabbing the stuff, and they were in packs of six and seven people and running out the front door. Nobody stopped them. Or they would go in with bags and grab boxes of shoes and all these different things, shoving them into bags and run out. Nobody stopping them. Society is going downhill really fast, isn't it? We just don't care. And here's, here's some other thoughts of how this command is violated and broken. I mean, people pilfer public property taking supplies from hospitals, building sites, schools, churches. I mean, think about it. Who's going to miss a, a few rolls of toilet paper or a box of wire or a container of spoons? I mean, really? I mean, citizens take from the government when we don't pay our taxes. Or we make false claims about disability or social security. And the government takes from us when they accumulate debt and don't fully pay it back. Or with no intent to fully pay it back because they're robbing from future citizens, aren't they? I mean, employees, let's be honest, employees take from work when you fill out false time cards or call in sick because you need a day off or you pad your expense accounts. But one of the most common is that we just, when people don't give a full day's work. You know, USA Today reports that 48% of Americans have taken something from their employer. And here's the thing, too, that when we don't, give, when we give less than our best effort, we are actually robbing our employer of the productivity that we owe. And yes, I understand that employers rob and steal from their employees when they demand longer hours than the contracts specify, downsize workforces to maximize profits but yet expect workers to maintain the same level, and if not more, and yet not paying them for what they expect. See, this is actually addressed in James chapter 5, verse 4, when it says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Listen, I know these are touchy subjects. I get it. But they're true, aren't they? And see, other things that we don't tend to think about when it comes to stealing. Adultery. It's no accident that the 
command on stealing follows the command on adultery because this sinful act robs the marriage covenant of the sacred vows made between a husband and wife. Failure to pay a debt. When you break a debt, you're stealing. When you don't return what you borrow from someone, you're breaking the command. Here's one that we don't think about when it comes to stealing. Malicious gossip and rumor. Amen. That's right. We don't think about that as stealing, do we? But what you're doing is you're actually stealing somebody's reputation. Proverbs 11.9 speaks to this. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. Again, we don't often think of stealing in this manner. Because on the surface, stealing reads simple, doesn't it? There's countless ways to steal. The Heidelberg Catechism summarizes it this way. In the Eighth Commandment, God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, but also wicked schemes and devices such as false weights and measures, deceptive merchandising and usury. We must not defraud our neighbor in any way, whether by force or by show. I mean, some of these things that we've looked at already this morning seem pretty straightforward, seem pretty common. Some of them we don't think about. So why do it? Well, one pastor suggested this. Three things. One, we're discontent with what God has given. The second is that we have distrust in the providence of of God. And the third thing is that we deny the love for our neighbor. So we've looked at some ways to, I mean, really, they're practical ways that we break the command. But what about, I mean, what's wrong with stealing? Well, when you look at a verse like Proverbs 13, 11, it says... Wealth gained hastily will dwindle. That's pretty straightforward. It's temporary. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. In other words, work for what you have. Not only does stealing dwindle, but it also brings shame. Jeremiah 2.26 as a thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. And another thing, when it comes to stealing, it starts small, but it tends to get bigger as time goes on. The less you get caught, the bigger you attempt, right? John 12, 6. Not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and had been charged of the money bag he used to help himself to what was put into it. <laughs> Who is this speaking about? Judas. Judas. He started off by helping himself to the money bag. Where did it lead him to? Who did he betray and for what? He betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Started small, got really big. Obviously, when we steal, we are taking from the person that owns it. But even more so, we are not trusting in God's provision. We're sinning against God and we're sinning against our neighbor. I like as one pastor wrote, when we take something that doesn't belong to us, we are denying that God has given us or is able to give us everything we truly need. So these are some practical aspects of the commandment, personal aspects of the commandment, societal aspects of the commandment.
But I want to dive a little bit deeper. As you know, you cannot just look at the superficial, just read it and go, okay, well, I don't steal packs of gum from Casey's. I don't take anything from Walmart. I don't do this. I don't do that. So I'm good. I don't steal. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Let's step on some toes. Stewardship. When it comes to the thought of breaking the Eighth Commandment, we don't often think about breaking the Eighth Commandment in conjunction with stealing from God. Because here's the thing. God calls us to give Him three things. He calls us to give of our time. <clears throat> See, there are so many things that are vying for our time and our attention. So much that we that are is packing our schedules. But it is is it our schedules that are becoming overloaded, or are we overloading them? I cannot tell you how many times I have been told that Sunday morning is the only day that I have to sleep in. Really? Why is that? Listen, COVID didn't help either. Let's address that nasty pandemic. Because it allowed people, yes, I understand COVID, I get it, I, I know all about it, I've had it twice. But what it did in a lot of ways, it exposed a lot of things, didn't it? It allowed people to become complacent and excuse riddled. A lot of people became content and comfortable with the couch. They became more committed to that on Sunday mornings rather than gathering together to pray, praise, and take in God's word. Now, don't misunderstand me. I totally know that there are reasons that people cannot come together on Sunday morning. I understand that. And that is not lost on me. But let's be honest. We make time to do what is most important to us. Right. So when it comes to time, are you stealing from God here because you don't give him the time that he deserves? Are you committed to gathering together weekly with God's people for praise and worship and the power of the word to growing together in discipleship not as I say but as this says Hebrews 10 24 and 25 let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That last part, folks, it's drawing near. So let's keep getting together, church. Amen? It's not just your time, but it's also your treasures. See, God asked a question in Malachi 3.8. Will man rob God? Yeah, you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. See, the word rob means forcibly. To steal. <clears throat> were they truly stealing from God? See, then the failure to pay the tithe... Could have included not giving at all. Could have been withholding part of it. Could have not been given in a timely manner. But that's where God then came and said, 
in verse 9 that they were indeed robbing him and that there was a curse. You are cursed with a curse. That's pretty straightforward. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. See, when we grovel, when we withhold what is his, meaning time and treasure, we're robbing God of his right to use us to propel the gospel into a world that so desperately needs it. That's why it says in the first part of verse 10, bring a whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The storehouse was the chamber in the temple where the tithes and offerings were kept. See, to recognize God's rightful rule, to recognize his omnipotent ownership of all things, that is key. His people were instructed to give tithes and offerings. The word tithe literally means a tenth or 10%. Now keep this in mind. We're no longer under the law. But tithing is a good benchmark for you and I as Christians. In other words, it's a great place to start. It's like a minimum guide for giving. J. Vernon McGee calls it a yardstick that we can measure ourselves by. The practice of tithing is a good reminder of who's in charge of my life. When I give at least 10%, it helps to remind me that God already owns everything that I have. We're just taking our hands off of what God already owns in the first place. And see, that leads to the last part of verse 10. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. A blessing. No more. I mean, when you give that 10%, when you give at least that, you're basically saying, okay, God, I, I trust you that I'm going to be able to live on the rest. And this is the only place where God says, test him. To test means to investigate. It means to prove something, that it's true. It almost doesn't sound right that God is saying, test me in this. Test me. That I'm going to bless you. And remember, Paul's writings in 2 Corinthians 9 to give with a cheerful what? Heart. Heart. So God says to give of your time, to give of your treasure, but he also says to give of your talents. Church, as a believer, you have been saved to serve. You were not saved to sit. <coughs> Romans 12, 6 says this very thing. It says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Every believer in this room has a gift. Let me ask you, are you using it? Are you using it to advance the kingdom? Are you using it to know Jesus and make him known? Are you using it to go out and gather the harvest? Are you using it to build the body? Are you using it to help make disciples? Are you using it to help build the kingdom?
God has called us to use the gifts to be on mission. Those gifts and abilities that we've been given. He didn't give you a gift to sit on it, to hide it under a bushel, did he? No. See, failing to use the gifts and talents that he has given to you is indeed a form of stealing from God. See, when we give, when we give less of our time, when we give less of our treasures, when we give less of our talents, we are indeed stealing from God. And I love the conversation that David and I had. What was that Thursday? I think it was. We were talking about the fact that it is a whole, indeed a whole body aspect. It's a whole body aspect. You can't say, well, I'll give of my treasure, but I can't give of my time and my talent. So I'm going to simply write a check and that'll be enough. God wants your treasure, but he wants your time and your talent too. Or you can't say, well, I'm, I'm giving of my time. So I'm going to withhold the treasure and the talent. It's not what scripture says. He wants your time, your treasure, and your talent. And you get the third one, right? That's what he calls us to do. When we withhold the things that are rightly his, we are indeed, in effect, stealing from him. And see, what the Bible means by ownership, when we're talking about God's providence, it's not possessing things to use for our own purpose, but receiving things from God to use for His glory. When you think about it, again, everything that we all have is already His. We've just been entrusted with it. And I love, I love this statement. To manage it in accordance with the Master's intentions. To manage it in accordance with the Master's intentions. Not mine. But His. To not be wasteful. To work hard. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12 speaks to this. And to aspire to live quietly. To mind your own affairs. To work with your hands as we instructed you. So that you may walk properly before outsiders. And be dependent on no one. To live generously. Not to just simply do things to satisfy your own means. And your own desires. But to meet the needs of others when the opportunity arises. See... Author Jerry Bridges puts it into great perspective when he says this, what attitude will you have? What's yours is mine, I'll take it. What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. Or what's mine is God's, I'll share it. Good stewardship starts with it taking care of our family. And then it extends to the church and the work of the gospel. And then it reaches into the community and beyond. A.W. Tozer reminds us that any temporal possession can be turned into everlasting wealth. In other words, invest with the kingdom in mind. Listen, this is not a tithing sermon. I promise you that. It's not. But I would be amiss if we didn't dive deeper into the understanding of what this commandment truly does entail. And to truly understand that we are not to steal from God. Matthew 
Proverbs 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I have a closing question for you, family. And this is a question that I had to ask myself and pray over. And I don't ask you lightly. I ask myself this question, am I a thief? And I ask you the same question. Are you a thief? One of the benefits, again, of studying the Ten Commandments is they confront us with our sin. I didn't say it was easy. See, when we dig deeper into the commandments, when we look at the full implications, we understand that we are not able to keep a single commandment in its full integrity. Thus, we're condemned by the law. It shows us that we are indeed sinners in need of the gospel. And the news of the gospel is that Christ died on the cross, rose again to give salvation to everyone that believes in him. And see, Jesus died on the cross in the place of sinners, in the place of thieves. He was crucified with two of them. Fulfilling prophecy in the Old Testament. It's also well known that he was crucified between two, because, but because of God's justice, there were three. Two that died for their own crimes, and one that died for mine. One that died for yours. He died for me. A thief. So that I could have the opportunity to turn, repent, and be saved. Would you bow? morning, we mentioned three things to give to God. Time, treasure, and talents. But there's one more thing. desires of you. The most important thing. And that's the fourth T. And that's the title to your life. We don't want to rob him of his glory. So the question is, are you robbing him of that glory? I mean, are you living for his glory or are you simply living for your story? I want to challenge and ask you, have you fully surrendered to God and given him the title to your life. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song of invitation. 
Have you given him the title? Is he indeed the Lord of your life? This altar is going to be open. You can come and you can pray. You can grab me. I would be happy to pray with you. You can grab Pastor David. You can grab somebody else. Man, if God is working on your heart right now, don't ignore it. Is he indeed the Lord of your life? Have you given him the title? But again, it's even more than a title. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Maybe you're here today and something struck a chord with you. The Lord has moved and you know it. Don't ignore it. Surrender. Get right. Father God, this is your time. Always is. There's not a minute that goes by that's not yours. So, Father God, I pray. God, you be glorified. Continue to be glorified. May you be lifted up. May you be praised. Have your way, God. Let's stand together as we sing. In the secret place where I see your face Will you take me there again? You can search my heart In the deepest part From beginning to the end To you my eyes are lifting To Consume me, consume me.
much as we Will you help me see You are all that I need Oh yes Lord You are all that I need Oh, 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 God, give me a heart of Praise you, you are more than enough. We thank you. We praise you. 